Um, so hello, my name is Bill Fraser. I'm the city manager. Uh, thanks for coming. I know there's been a lot of conversation about the senior center, where it's at uh, with the city. I'd like, so my goal today is to address some of the rumors and, and things that have been floating around and to uh, give you some background, talk about what our thinking is, where we're at, and to answer any questions and take your comments at the end so that we can figure out how we're all going to move forward together. Um, we certainly want to have a thriving and successful senior center. That's been the city's goal all along and remains. So let's, let's talk for, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We can see and hear? All right. Thanks. Okay, so what I'm hoping to talk about today, I just did a little introduction. I want to talk immediately about a couple of the things that I know you're most concerned about, the space upstairs and the uh, vacant position. So I'll hit those first. Then I want to talk about some background information about the center and the, its history with the city and its operations so people have a sense of perspective. Go through some of the finances of the city and the senior center so that people understand where we're at now. You've heard that we're doing an assessment process. Uh, I'm going to describe that a little bit. And then, um, and then uh, obviously, take questions and comment. So that's my plan for today. Um, and some of this you may have heard from Kelly before, but I think it's a worth, uh, it needs to be repeated because it's all part of the, um, so I'm getting told that, can people hear me? Because some people are saying they can't, and some people are saying they can. It's muffled. <laughs> further, okay, I had it further away, and people were saying they couldn't hear. How's that? I'll try to do, okay. Well, this is probably the best I'm going to do, so bear. Got it. All right. Rock the mic. Okay, so people, uh, you're upstairs that we, we used the two rooms upstairs. We did have a catastrophic flood in the city just two months ago. It wiped out all of City Hall, wiped out most of the upstairs. If people want to see, there's a, there's a video uh, that I did on YouTube. You can take a tour of City Hall and see how bad it is. So we needed to move space rapidly. The people upstairs are doing essential functions. I think it's important to understand. Um, the planning people are doing the permitting, inspections for all the homes that have been ruined, all the businesses that have ruined, all the building, trying to help people get open. I, I'm sorry, I'm doing the best I can with the mic. Um, and they are, that's, that's essential to the functioning of our downtown. I un we understand that it is inconveniencing the scene. How's this? Beautiful. I hate these things. So we understand that having the offices upstairs is a problem for the senior center. We don't want to be here either. They don't want to be here either. I mean, they want to be somewhere. But the functions that are happening are essential to the operations of the entire city. And the senior center is part of the city operation. So we needed to put them somewhere. We need to make sure our businesses get reopened. We need to make sure the people who lost their homes have, are getting the funding they need to rebuild their homes. We need to make sure the buildings that are damaged are being properly inspected in an expeditious way so we can get them reopening. The, the downtown reopening that you're seeing is partly because we've been able to turn everything around so fast, as well as the efforts of the landlords and the business owners. So that's what's going on upstairs. People aren't just taking the spaces to prevent you from having the classes that you have. Our finance operation is managing $10.8 million of damage to city facilities as a result of the flood. Try to make sure we get FEMA uh, funds back so that all of us as taxpayers don't have to pay for that. So I appreciate that it's inconvenienced. There's a lot of people that have been inconvenienced by this flood. So we're all sacrificing a little bit, and we're asking you to participate in that and help support what we need to do. That said, we've heard your concerns, and actually the place, like I said, the space doesn't work perfectly for city offices either. So this week, we're moving the finances office out. You will be getting your room back by next week. The police department is giving up their space so that the finance office can operate in there. And 
two people will be going back to the clerk's office, which is not handicapped accessible, which we are required to be by law. One of the reasons we are here is because there's an elevator and we can provide services legally. So I just want you to know that nobody put offices in these places to get you guys all mad. We are in an emergency. We needed to do something. You heard two years. That was the worst case scenario. We, we think it could be as long as two years before City Hall is reopened. If we can get our offices out of there earlier, we will. That's our goal. It's, be, it's good for everybody. So I, I just am really concerned when I hear the rhetoric about the city doesn't care about us. They're taking our space. Okay, that is city-owned space. This is city-owned space. You're part of the city government, and we're all in this together. Okay, so another question I heard was that the city charges MSAC rent. That is absolutely not true. You're a city government, just like any city function like everybody else. It's part of a condo. The city owns this building with the, the um, housing authority upstairs. There are condo fees. Those are part of the senior center budget because it's part of operating the senior center. Anybody in this space would be paid for it, but it is part of the city budget. So as I said, we, needed to, we need to provide the essential functions. So we do understand. We don't like, like I said, we'll be out of there as soon as we can. You will get your space back. That is not a permanent change. Vacant staff position. You had a director who was here till June 30th, and she left. July 10, we had the flood. We will fill that position. You, I keep hearing that the city says we are not going to fill the uh, People saying we will not fill the position. That is not true. What we don't know is what that position will look like. Part of the reason we're doing the assessment is to know what skills and abilities are needed and best used strategically so that we can make this successful. And at the same time, the entire city is in a hiring freeze. Why? Again, the flood. We are losing all our rooms, meals, and alcohol revenue. We're losing all our parking tax revenue. We, have, we will have many, many tax abatements from buildings that were damaged by the, by the flood. We're expecting to be running about $1.5 million short in this fiscal year, the budget year we're in now. That's our current estimate. So we're holding. We have four vacant DPW positions, two vacant rec positions, this one and a couple others. No one is picking on the senior center. Every week that we go without, we're saving some money to help close our deficit while we're giving some thoughtful process to what we need. So you will have a new position back. It's coming. We just don't know what it's going to look like yet. And we're asking for your participation in how that's decided. That's part of the assessment I'm going to talk about in a minute. So some background information. The Senior Center originally started as part of recreation in the 70s. It remained under recreation and through the school board department until 2009. The last year it was with the school department, the tax, uh, tax appropriation was $87,000. The next year the, senior uh, the city took it over and immediately bumped it up to $125,000. I hear this sometimes because people say the city doesn't care or hasn't invested in the senior center. Um, we also, uh, as a result, thank, I hate to say thank you, but thanks to a fire, we re uh, rebuilt this entire facility to a much nicer condition than it was. The current budget that we're in right now has $188,000. It's a 50% increase since the city took it over, which is 10% more than inflation, and 117% increase since the school last had it. So the city has certainly not shirked its financial responsibility. The recreation director, some may remember Don Lorinovich, Don served as the director of the senior center with an activities director underneath him for years. And when the city, so the city got the senior center when the schools moved out of this building. So we took it over. At that point, the rec department, which by then Arnie was the director, was still under the school. So we didn't administratively control the rec department. So instead, we put the assistant city manager, who was Bev Hill at the time, in charge of the senior center with the activities director under her. That seemed unsustainable, so we switched it to a director position with the assistant city manager, as you've heard us talk about community services. Uh, so we have rec parks and senior center and assistant city manager kind of is their department head. That is still the case. 
Had the wreck been under the city when they came over, we would have retained that same structure. So the proposal to have this be a division of recreation is really just what had been done since the beginning of the senior center. It's not a new uh, director. So the first senior center director was hired, actual director was hired in 2012, that was Jana Clare, and she was here until recently. In 2016 and 17, the city council, uh, or at least a couple of members, uh, and I found it interesting some of the commentary from one of your members in the recent bridge, but that council member proposed capping the budget to the senior center and spinning it off as a nonprofit in a way to reduce city employees. The city council as a whole chose not to do that. And instead uh, said, no, we're going to maintain it and we're going to fund it. In 2017 or so, the, the council chose to bring Feast in as a city program, maybe a little bit later than that. Well, first it was run by Just Basics, then we brought it in as a city-funded program, and then more recently we, um, we then brought it in-house to actually be run by our own staff. Um, to save money, ostensibly, but it actually has gone just the opposite. So take a look at where money comes from. This is it, you've seen this all before. Basically about 20, so what is called operating transfers is our budget accounting speak for tax money. So about 25% of you is, of this is funded by our tax budget. You have your investments, your fees, and charges for service, miscellaneous revenue, grants, et cetera. So that's what makes up your funding. This is an activity-based program. It is intended for much of its activities to cover their own costs with the admin covered, um, which the city provided admin to run the place. So as we take a look over the last few years, you can see Revenues and expenses were mostly good. The blue is the expenses, excuse me, the revenues. The, the uh, brown is the, uh, is the expenses. But the last couple of years, we've been in a big deficit. The budget for next year, for the current year, of course, we budget for it to be balanced, but we don't actually know what happens until, obviously, COVID, um, things went way down. And we got a bunch of federal money and all that. You know, that was kind of a wacky year. but. Since COVID, um, we've really been running at a deficit. So the city's been making that up, basically, uh, because it has to be covered somehow. What, so anyway, I'll just leave it at that for now. Could you point out the deficit in that chart? Excuse me? Could you point out the deficit in that chart? It looked like a wash. Here's the expenses, here's the revenues. $50,000, something like that? That's entirely possible. Fundraising. So the question was, I referenced COVID, but also noticing that we had uh, um, an experienced director who was a good fundraiser leave, and I think that may well be part of it. So I think part of what we need to understand is what are the balances that we need and what are the skills that we need of somebody that comes in. So it goes back to, uh, so these are the uh, funds that come from grants in other towns. You'll see the current year is really high. That is a one-time grant from National Life for uh, specific things. It's not really an operational cost, so it doesn't necessarily represent an ongoing uh, external revenue. Senior center class fees, uh, um, not really a surprise that during COVID, those class fees dropped, but you can see where you were in FY18 and 19 and where you are now. So that is something we need to figure out as we, as we take a look. How can we build those back? I know you all want to, we all want to. So if you look at, these are just the program profits. You can see we were making about 122, we we're clearing about $122,000 on class fees pre-COVID. And it dropped down, of course, and has, uh, last year was a little bit lower than the year before. So we're, you know, a little more than half of where we were. So this is our challenge collectively. Same thing with membership dues. They're slowly eking back, which is great. Um, obviously, uh, again, you can trace it really to COVID. And our membership. So we had a high of almost 1,200 people in 2019. We're at 757, of which 523 are Montpelier residents. Um, so that's, 
that's all part of the challenge is how do we maintain, can we maintain the same overhead and infrastructure that we had for 1,200 members as we can for 800 members? And what does that look like? So general fund transfers, like I said, that's, uh, that's the fancy name for tax dollars. Again, I keep hearing that the city has not put more money into the senior center. And actually what I find interesting is the best years that you had, the years when it was the most robust, we're in here. And what this is saying is that this, the taxpayers have had to pay more and more and more for less members, less activities because of the shortfalls. And in part because we adjusted pay for, for people and we agreed to that. So that's fair. The staff here should be paid like the rest of the city. So that's part of it. Oops, come on. Oh, so just taking a look at our overall staff cars. Again, you can see that the staffing has risen. Um, and now here's the non-meals uh, staff cost. So this is just operating the center. So in addition to staff, there's been other costs, just operations costs. Now, that's not a huge surprise. Everything costs more these days, and city budget has. Who's in that group? Who's the staff? Who, who's in the non-meal staff? No, non-meal non -meal, non -meal staff costs. That's everybody but the meals program. But, but the question was, who is in non-meal staff? I'm going to, Kelly, can you help me out here? Yep. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Um, so, currently, um, we have a vacant position that is filled by Kathy Lee, who is the Director of So, it's the director, the admin people, the program people, everybody but the two people that work in meals. What does it mean? What does Kelly for? Yes, par portions of Arnie. I don't know about Kelly. Uh, and, and portions. Yeah. My fund split or my, my allocation from the budget is not Can fine. you speak to the back rows, please? Well, Everybody's turn. Okay. So All right. Sorry, everyone. I'm going to try my best to project. Is that better? Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna do my tell me this best. quick answer and I'll tell All right. them. Sounds good. Um, so we currently have the way Just, that we're structured. What did that represent? So this represents one vacant position. One director or vacant position. This represents full time. Full time, yes. yes. One admin. One admin. Is that Norma? Yes. And then one um, fundraising communications person. Matt. Yeah. So it was the, the, what was Sarah, Norma, and Matt? Does that help? Keep yelling to us way back here, please. What's that? Yes. Yeah, so Keep yelling way back here because we can't. So the, the non-meal staff are the vacant director position, Norma, and Matt. Does that help? So then the meals costs, excuse me, yes? Yes, can you tell me are those all full time? Yes. Full time dedicated to MSAC. Well, some, I think some might be split with RAC, and so the funding would yeah. be split with RAC. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, so they're not full time. Yeah, they're, they're full time positions, full -time. but yeah, split between RAC. Well, again, you know, that cuts both ways. We have tried to save you as taxpayers money by, by blending RAC parks and seniors in a way that we can use uh, class so registration. What percentage of those positions are? Uh, I, we can give you that information. I'm not sure. The question the was question? how are these split out? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you that we can get you that answer. I'm not sure it's getting into that level of detail is yeah, helpful for important. the. It is important and we'll get you the information. But um, I, I, you know, going into decimal points and budgets isn't really what we're here to talk about. Um, so obviously with the food service, we had been overseeing food service, and then you can see the last three years, that's when we brought it in-house and started hiring staff, and those costs have grown. Now this is our non-staff food service. Now again, back in FY17, that's when we contracted out um, those services, and then at some point we took it over. But what's interesting is if you look at that total of what we're paying for food, et cetera, plus the non-food, you add those together, we're actually paying more than we were when we were contracting it, and we thought it was too expensive. <laughs> okay, the vote in the room was for me not to use the microphone. I'll try to be louder. I apologize, but the microphone wasn't really working for people either. We're, we're gonna have a lot of time for questions. We're not all deaf back here, but we sim when people speak too fast, too soft, or turn their heads, just you and them, and the screen, 
There's no way the voice can come out here. So I respectfully ask if you be really considerate. I, I can try, hear, I, but these people can't hear. We're not deaf. Okay. Well, I can try this again. How is that working for other people? All right. Well, we'll do this until people decide we won't. Um, so anyway, we, we've, we've had a lot of increases in the food program. We've also had a lot of improvements in the quality of the food program. There's no question about that. So one of the challenges is how do we match the revenues with the expenses and what does that program look like? That's one of the things we're looking at. Okay, so our preliminary analysis is basically this, we need a lot of attention here. We're not ignoring you. We're actually paying a lot of attention. We're trying to figure out, hopefully with you, how we can turn this around. Um, the budget is clearly out of balance. The membership is dropping. Revenue sources are not matching our expenses. And all of those conditions existed when we had a full-time director and two rooms. So to, you know, I think this isn't unique to the last two months. This is a situation that's been happening for a couple of years. And we need to figure out how to come in and right the ship. And the best way to do that is to look at all of the programs. And as I mentioned, the city's finances are in, in not great shape. So to come in and just give a bailout isn't really a full time, uh, isn't really the right solution. And as some, I've heard some people suggesting that we take some of the reserve or, or uh, dedicated funds, the Jackman Fund, to pay for a position. And I can tell you that is really bad financial management. It's taking your savings account to pay your groceries bills, not for when the roof breaks. We use those bequested funds to pay for uh, capital improvements, one-time expenses, those kinds of things. And we use the interest from that fund as an operating revenue for the senior center. So I, I understand that's a, a conversation. We're happy to have it, but I can tell you that as a professional and as our finance department, we would strongly recommend against that uh, if it were ever to come to the city council. So the process, we gotta remove all, the pro all of our programs. What's working, what isn't working? What are we charging? Is what is membership look like? What, how does that go? What's the correct amount of staffing that we should have for each position? And what is, um, what do we need for each, each program? You know, we've heard from some of our external funding sources, uh, people that oversee these, that have come to us saying, your center is in bad shape, you gotta make some changes. So it's not just us telling us this. So we need to figure out how this goes. We will be conducting, you know, have conducted, we'll continue to conduct member surveys and meetings like this to hear from you. We will be talking to folks, we'll be making some recommendations, and the goal, obviously, is we got a budget that's gonna come up in a couple months, November, December, we present our budget to the city council. We need to be able to say something to them by then. So the desired outcome is increasing membership, and people really clearly understanding the value of members, of being members, an evaluation of the fee structure. Are we charging too much or not enough? Um, so increased support for of and for member towns. Last year, we didn't get all of our member towns supporting us. Focus on fundraising through grants and spo sponsorships. You know, as someone mentioned correctly, we had a very robust fundraising program here, and that has tailed off. Why? And who's responsible? What does that look like? What's the strategy for that? Back to basics. Let's make sure we're doing all the things that people like. We want to have a great senior center and, the, and a staff structure which matches the needs, not just because we used to have it, it needs to happen now. So how can you help? I mean, that's a kind of open-ended question, but I, you know, someone stopped me, I think, correctly before this meeting and said there's a lot of things that aren't getting done. I don't doubt it. A lot of things aren't getting done throughout the whole city right now because we're all pulled in a million different directions. But what can you do? Are there things that people could volunteer for to pick up? Are there things that people could help? Is there activities that aren't happening um, in the short run? And how can you help us work together to come up with a good plan for the future of the senior center? I know I was speaking a little hardly and it's not because, it, you know, I just feel like these are messages that need to be said. There's been an awful lot of criticism that was seemed like it wasn't necessarily understanding the basis of what was going on. So I want to be clear what's going on and why. You're going to get your space back. You're going to get your position. 
and we're trying to figure out how to build a solid foundation. So that's kind of the end of my res Now you can have at it. Tori. Actually, two, two things. One is that another, another, another thing that happened in 2019 is that um, the swimming pool up in Berlin was sold to a different person who stopped giving the discount for people who belong to the senior center. Um, I think probably that's part of the drop in membership, that $15 a year, which is what membership was at that time, was worth it for a significant cut in the cost of swimming, which is how I happened to get involved in the senior center at all in the first place. And I have a feeling I'm not the only one. So I would, I would look at that. The other thing is that when you, um, when you lose your community organizer, something happens to a community. Hire a really good community organizer like you had for 10 years, put the money into that and get them working and building community and you'll have the community back. Thank you. So for those that didn't hear that, the main comment was uh, uh, the suggestion that once we lost the connection to the swimming pool in Berlin, that a lot of people dropped membership because that was a big draw, that the, the cost of membership for having access to the swimming pool was really good and that obviously was something beyond the city's control. We are, as you know, engaged in a process of discussing whether we should build a new community center at the Elks Club and what that would include. Can't guarantee that would have a pool, but it's certainly being talked about. Um, so yes, we, we understand that. The other part of the comment was about having a good community organizer um, and you know making sure we have somebody like that back. Can't agree more um, and would also say that um, I received a lot of complaints about that person when they were here. So it's again, it's hard. You know, it's tough to please everybody um, all the time, and that's one of the problems with these kinds of positions. So, so I have a one question about the hiring freeze. Is it absolute, and for how long is it in, in effect? Two-parter. So the question was about the hiring freeze. Is it absolute, and for how long is it in effect? And the answer is, it's not absolute, and it won't be on forever. Um, I can't tell you exactly when it's going to be over. We are trying to monitor how much we're saving. Um, the, the good news, good thing with hiring freezes, you can save money fast. The bad thing about hiring freezes is that they're not at all strategic, right? So you just have a freeze by whoever happens to leave. So you have a senior center without a director. You have four DPW people out, but no police or fire people out. So, you know, it's not. It's not like here's where the highest needs are. So we will be assessing that. I would suspect we will start filling positions. I think with this particular position, it's a combination of the freeze and wanting to make sure we hire the right person for the right work uh, and not just hire someone and then tailor it to their skills. So, so that's that. So that leads into my next question, which is um, how by the time this assessment is done and there's you know, a recommendation about hiring, that's gonna be January and we're gonna be halfway through this fiscal year and we're gonna be really struggling. So one of my questions is, there's lots of things not getting attention now, fundraising, grant writing, programming. You know, Arnie and, and um, Kelly have lots to do, but they've been assigned to do this and when you say get volunteers together, that requires somebody in charge of you know, really trying to make it all happen. There's so many things that are not going on right now, and I'm really afraid that six months from now, then we go through a hiring process, and maybe we'll have somebody next February, and we're done. That is a great point, and um, I don't know what else to say other than that's a great point, and I'll, we'll think about that. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm not trying to blow you off. I think that is an excellent point, particularly around the fundraising and those kind of things, so we will take note of that. I, I actually agree with almost everything you said. So um, I can't give you an answer exactly what we're going to do about that, but I appreciate you saying it. Uh, let's see. You've had your hand up a lot. Thank you. Um, about the assessment, who, when, what process, consultant, National Council on Aging, Senior Center Institute involved, how, what is the approach to the assessment? Yep, thanks. We're doing it internally in part to save money and time. Um, to bring in outside people costs more money and 
It takes more time. We're trying to move this to the point of the prior uh, person. So it's being done, led mostly by Kelly, and with your own, uh, there have been, well, do, you know, I appreciate that you don't like that. And if we were to use an outside consultant, we'd be a year before we have a result. So if you prefer that, we can do that. But we're trying to move this quickly. We're trying to use our expertise. This is not rocket science. We're trying to look at our programs and figure out what it takes to run them. And with your help, we can do that. Part of it is talking to you. It's talking with your advisory council. I think there was a member or two that were involved with the process. Um, so I, you know, I can't remember who they are. But we get it. Um, but we're trying to move this along. We'd like to be in a position to hire someone for you. And we don't want to take a long time. So I appreciate that. Um, but that's the choice that we made. And I understand. across the state and the nation for comparison and best practices issues. There are a lot of questions. It's perfectly doable internally, but I just want to be sure that some of these points will be hit because it's terribly important. I agree. And we can, ex we can go into a longer term comparison of that. We're really looking at what's the gap in, in meals cost? What's the gap in programming? What's the gap? What do we need to get this back together? What kind of skills do we need someone to come in? So we're calling it an assessment. This isn't a full consultant project. This is just something's wrong. How do we fix it? I do think when you're talking about a strategic plan for the longer run that having someone with broader knowledge, we are consulting with the Central Vermont Council on Aging. We're consulting with people in the field. Um, but you know, there aren't really many senior centers in Vermont that compared to this one, we are pretty far ahead of most other places already, and um, they're all operating. You know, our You know, I mean, I'm not saying this to be a wise guy, but our facility here, even without those two offices, is probably better than most places around. Um, but we, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make it better. So appreciate your question. Um, can someone help me manage the hands? They're just all flying, and I don't so. No, I'm the troublemaker. But anyhow, I'm just thinking outside the box. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, th I think we need to look a little outside the box in thinking about all this. We're the prob there are only Burlington and here that are part of the city government that we have senior centers. I don't think of that as progress. I think of that as being taken over. <laughs> Senior centers should be separate. We should be like the Kellogg Hubbard Library. The town gives money to them. That's what most towns do. I came from Waitsfield, Evergreen Place. Uh, all the towns in the valley gave money to, the, to Evergreen Place. A great system of volunteers. Those who didn't want to come to, to be there, there were retired teachers retired uh, economists, retired accountants who could do budgets. We need to think outside the box. It's not just about city government. It's not about how we fit into their structure. It's how we as a group can become ourselves and get help from the city. And, and I think we could maybe get all the recreation programs could come from the city. But some of the classes that I see now, you only have to be 18 years old to go to them. So that is not a senior program. And I think that we could keep the recreation program and all the recreation services without even using this building. And then we could pay rent here to the city or we could look elsewhere for something better <laughs> or build in the future, and I probably won't be around for that, but I just, I think we need to think outside the box. And in terms of the accounting, I agree with this lady over here that we need to get some senior centers involved and in, in look to the national groups of senior centers. Hi, thanks. I'm gonna try it at this angle, which I think works better. 
So um, I'm going to lay this to a trou de memoir, which is like a senior moment for Bill. Because when you say that the revenue was down and the membership was down, and that existed with the director and all the rooms open, you're talking about the last three years. Three years ago, I was in my kitchen washing every box and bottle that I bought because of COVID, to leave COVID out of the equation and a new director who was focused, from what I understand, on Feast. When we had a director and no COVID and all the rooms open, we were golden. So let's not, I just, I don't accept that explanation, Bill. I agree with that. Um, I think the point being is that some of the pushback has been, we need the director, we need the rooms, and this, that's what's killing us. I agree, COVID was the big, the big issue. However, we've existed really in a post-COVID uh, environment for a couple of years. People are here. Oh, I know that COVID still exists, but programs have been running, things have been open, stores, all that stuff. We, uh, we all did. Well, most of us don't like Zoom. I can tell you that for sure. Uh, well, fair enough. And I think it still means that the adjustments were not made during that era to correct the course. You know, you can't just do what you always did if you have changes in your, in your programming and income stream. So I think, well, you know, it's true. If, if you suddenly live at your house and say you get a pay cut, you can't just keep doing what you were doing. You have to make adjustments to it. And that's part of the issue, is what kind of adjustments need to be made so that we can live in today's environment and grow this back to where it was. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. I'm not trying to argue with you. Uh, certainly, COVID was a huge factor. I, I have a couple of thoughts. I'm with Dal. Uh, first of all, I think what really helped um, is we had job descriptions for everybody. Um, it's very hard to get a job description, but you hired Arnie to be part of the senior center, so what are his job descriptions? I think if that part was clear, um, that would really help this whole um, process. The other thing is that Meals on Wheels has never made any money through all the iterations that it's had, and I'm wondering what would happen if Meals on Wheels went somewhere else. It's a great program, but maybe it should pro um, Pro, maybe it should be working with um, food pantry now they're in a new um, place. Also, I can tell you that we're the only department that has to fundraise and a lot of us are really sick of fundraising. Did you want to answer for that? Uh, I, do you need the answer or is that a comment? Did, did you, were you looking for a response or was that just a comment? Uh, I, I assume we have them. I, I'd have to check on that. Um, Arnie was put in to oversee the operation much like it always was before uh, until we hired Jana, and in part because we are short right now. Um, I mean, he, he would be the department head. There will be a person in, in that job whose job description has yet to be defined. With regard to fundraising, um, appreciate that comment. And the question was, you know, we're the only department that has to fundraise. Um, you, you are an important function. I mean, recreation fundraises through its programs. It makes enough money in its programs to cover its costs, and then there's a set tax allocation. There's a set tax allocation for this operation, and then the difference has to be made up. Most senior centers fundraise. Um, not if you go Mary Alice's route and go to nonprofit, you'll be fundraising all the time, probably more than you are now. Um, so I appreciate that, and you know, as I said, we're serving, you know, I, I, having a public safety department. I mean, comparing a department like police, fire, public works, you know, to this as far as fundraising, it's just not really 
compare, you know, those are essential, not that this isn't important, but those are essential public safety services. When you think of any town in Vermont, regardless of its size, what does it do? They plow the roads, they have a volunteer fire department, and they contract with the sheriff, like, and they have their land records. Like, that's what you do if you're a town. Those are the, this is, when you're at the very center of what local government does, that's what it is. Having them fundraise um, just seems kind of, but I appreciate the comment, and it's certainly um, one of the areas we want to look at is what, how much fundraising is necessary um, and how appropriate is it and what's it for. So I think those are fair questions. I have a question about parks. Um, parks, recreation, and the senior center are all a part of community services. Recreation department did not run a deficit, as I recall. Parks ran a huge deficit. Parks is also ex I mean, I believe you, I just don't remember. Oh, um, and Sorry. somehow the Parks has, I believe, North Branch expansion was approved by City Council. Certainly a lot of money has gone into the uh, Country Club Road program. There's no, I haven't heard a discussion about how is Parks programs gonna be looked at for cost and effectiveness and scale back if necessary. Why is it the senior center that's under scrutiny when our deficit was far smaller than parks and we serve a vital, what, 40% of the population of Montpelier? Thank you. Good question about land purchase. None of that came, that was all came from grant monies. None of that came from city money. The, uh, the expansion? Correct. Was? That's all grants? Yeah, it's on, in fact, the approval for closing is on this week's, next week, I'm sorry. So the question is about a, a parcel of land, expansion of the North Branch Park, it's gonna be about $65,000. It's all grant funds, it's off of Gould Hill Road, and actually the approval to purchase that will be on this Wednesday's, the final approval will be on this, but it's all coming from grant funds. It's not, and the same with the, the Berlin Pond land that we bought for watershed preservation also all came from grant money. So I hear you, with regard to parks, we, we, they have not run systemic deficits, and we look at those all the time. And, um, you know, uh, so we're, we're always looking at all our budgets to, for, for deficits and, and fixing. Two easy questions. <clears throat> um, I think I missed this, you talked about we'll be getting the space back at least for one office, hope, or one classroom, maybe two, with the possibility of them moving over to the police station. I didn't hear a date on that. And the other one is a date on when we will be expecting to get a new uh, leader, director, activities director, whatever that position is. The first one's easy. Um, thank you, Lindsay. Uh, the, that room should be back to your, to, to seed your center use by next week. Uh, they're moving out now. There's only one person left up there. The one, if you go up the stairs to the right. So that one is being cleared out now. Um, and the finance staff will be in the police station and in City Hall, the, in the clerk's office. So they will be split. The planning office and Montpelier Alive and Communications and Kelly's offices don't know if we can find another place to get them. With regard to hiring, I, I don't, we don't have a hard answer for that. We need to make decisions by budget time, and we hear loud and clear that the longer it waits, the harder it is. So, I mean, we would like to speed this up, but we, again, it goes back to who are we hiring for what purpose. Some notes just while you were speaking, Bill. Um, you said at the beginning, we're all sacrificing a little bit. I think from the perspective of many of us here, we feel like we're sacrificing a lot more than a little bit. Second thing, um, I remember a few years ago, wasn't that long ago, Arnie declared that the pool would not open. I can't remember why, whether it had to do with couldn't hire lifeguards or some technical problem. And the city council said no. That's not acceptable. The pool, you will find a way to open the pool. And miraculously, the pool opened. 
I would like to see that level of creative thinking going on at the city relative to the senior center. Let's get the equivalent of our pool open. Also, many f Norma is the only person on staff who remembers how amazingly vibrant this place was pre-COVID. That's unfortunate. We used to have a culture of excellence here. There was a zenith when Jana Clare was the director. The food under Justin Turcott was amazing. This room was full of people on Tuesday, full. A hundred or more people having lunch here. People vote with their feet. If the quality of the food returns, and you said that the food program has improved, it has not improved. Senior centers in other places serve gray, squishy green beans. I don't want that here. We haven't had that in the past. We shouldn't accept that. The food was better before. It was nutritious. There was quantity, quality. It was amazing. It could be that again. There used to be a culture of excellence. MSAC's problems didn't begin with the flood. We all know the decline began years ago, and we can't put it all at the feet of COVID. Why didn't the city step in sooner when the numbers started to go south? And lastly, you're quoted in today's bridge as saying, and this is relative to the FEMA trailers, and, and bringing in a 12-inch pipe instead of an 8-inch pipe. Quote, even in hard times, you have to make good decisions looking forward. So I would ask you and Kelly and other leaders of the city to please make good decisions going forward for us. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate that feedback. Um, back. Okay, good. Is this good? Yes. Okay. Um, referring to the Parks Department, there's some money that was set aside for making uh, Confluence Park. Is it possible that that money could then be used? That's not going to be used for the park right now, that's for sure. And also, the Parks Department was um, creating, has a plan for a mountain bike trail up behind the State House. So those are two programs that probably could be delayed a little bit and that money used for something else. You want to comment, Bill? Uh, well, yes. Okay. Confluence Park is on the agenda this week, for next week for the City Council meeting, whether to continue that program. Just so people know, there was, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than just money. It was a $600,000 bond that was approved. We, uh, grant money was used to, to, to design the park. If we do not build it, we have to repay the grant money. So that's about $150,000. That would leave the remaining $450,000, which could either just not be issued, which means the city doesn't have the debt payment on it, or issued and used for something else. So that is a conversation city council is going to have on Wednesday night. Oh. It bothers me that the financial people are making the decisions about what I consider essential subject, the subject or the heart of the senior center. The advisory co committee, as I understand, used to, used to be that there was a governing board. Does any, why did that happen? Why was that given up? In other words, it seems to me that the city is overstretched your offices by taking care of recreation, this, and community services. I know it's easy for you to say, oh, but we share because so-and-so, Matt, can come over here and sit in the office and take care of our communication, which is very important right now. But there are, you know, it just doesn't make sense to me to have the decision of what kind of director is needed being made by totally financial people. What, so, what, what was the governing board? Why was that changed? So, to my knowledge, at least, well, I've only been here for 28 years. 
But in my knowledge, we've, there's never been an independent governing body. There's always been the advisory council. No, Pri we, we used to be a governing board under the education department. I was on, the I was on that, and we were not advisory. I appreciate that. I'd like to, I'll check on that. Um, I'm not sure that squares with my understanding. The, the school board oversaw the rec department and, and the senior center, and the advisory board, for example, there's a rec board, which is advisory, and they provide guidance on programs and in, input, but they are not the governing body. There's a parks commission, which oversees the parks, but at the end of the day, if you're a city program, the buck stops with the manager and the city council. And uh, I believe when it was under the school board, that was always the way it was. But they listened to us as if we were. They, yes. they just took uh, what we said. And yeah. So Mary Alice is clarifying that they listened and took what the board said. And I believe, to, to your point, we don't want finance people making these decisions. We want to hear and engage the advisory board in these exact decisions. Um, we as the city need though, to look at all of our city finances. You know, again, you're not the only hurting program right now. Everyone is hurting. And we have to balance all of this. I appreciate that you are here representing you, the program that you love. And I, that's, I admire that. That's awesome. And we have to look at how we're providing all the other services as well as yours. So there is a financial component. We can't just let things continue to get worse. And I, you know, to the question of why didn't we jump in earlier? We were letting, we, we knew we were coming out of COVID. We knew there was gonna be a couple of rocky years. We were trying to guide for a course correction and we're not seeing it, so we're trying to do the course correction now. This is not gonna be a forever thing. We wanna get back going as soon as we can. Director. So, Advisory committee have. Can I speak? Yes, you please do. Now? Yes. So the advisory, I'm Diane McCary, I'm chair of the group this year, and uh, the advisory council, by governance, you know, policy is one that advises. Oh, I'm here to help. Is that okay? <laughs> is one that advises the director, and so our our conversations with the, at our meetings are always about what's happening in the center, you know, and. Um, really getting a report from the director and occasionally being asked for advice. That, that could change, but it is an advisory council. We don't have any decision-making uh, possibilities in policy. Thank you, Diana. And to answer the question, to answer, to answer the question, well, I, advisory committees are really important. We tend to pay a lot of attention to them, so I, I do you know, appreciate that. To answer the specific question, though, um, the last two times that we hired directors, uh, there were representative, a representative or two from the advisory committee on the hiring committee, uh, and we would fully anticipate doing that again. Absolutely, there should be involvement from members in, in that. I, I guess I'm really stuck on what are we going to do right now? You know, um, you said, you know, we all have to work on this, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's all fine and good, but when we leave here, Who's going to be organizing fundraising? Who's going to be organizing getting programs? Who's going to be organizing getting volunteers when we have two people sort of in charge, but they are really busy? So what's the solution? Um, I don't have the solution right now, but I can tell you so far, based on this conversation, that's the number one question we're taking away from this conversation today. So we will huddle and answer that because I, I hear what you're saying loud and clear that there's an immediate need and we got to figure out how to address it so thank you for that um, I, I want to ask um, I want to ask a question a couple of questions of the audience um, let's see how many people here, this, these are personal questions, so you don't have to answer, but how many people here have been to a memorial service in the last three months, five months, for a close friend or a family member? Could you raise your hand if you've been to a memorial service in the last three or four months for a close friend? Okay, thank you. How many people here um, have lost a spouse or a partner, a long-term partner, in the last five years? 
Anybody? Yeah. Okay. How many people here are caring for a partner who has Parkinson's, who has dementia, um, who has some sort of degenerative um, illness that requires caretaking? Raise your hand, please. Yes, right, right. They're not here because they're home taking care of them. I, I had lunch yesterday with a close friend of mine. She's a vibrant, intelligent, together person like many of the people in this room. Um, and her husband's had Parkinson's for the last 10 years. She presents as upbeat and positive with a positive attitude. She is lonely. She is stuck at home almost all the time. When I asked her, tell me really, Diane, how is it going? She said, Julia, I'm up to my elbows in urine every day. And when, I sit, when he sits down and I give him his food, he stares at it. And I come back a few minutes later, cleaning up the kitchen. I come back, and he, he's got his spoon in his hand, and he doesn't know what to do with it. Now, I'm bringing these things up because I think that the, the territory that we live in when we get into our 60s, 70s, and 80s is not only personal loss like a hip, a knee, uh, our memory, uh, but it's also a series of losses of the people that we care about most, the people that we're close to. And we are constantly dealing with loss, loss, loss. And if you then end up sitting in your apartment or your condo alone through the long Vermont winter, it is awful. And I think, and I heard this the last time I attended uh, the, the um, discussion meeting here, this place has been an absolute lifesaver. It's not just a nice recreation center for people. I think that's why you're seeing so much vehemence, Bill. <laughs> I, th I think it's hard to know when you're in your 50s and 60s what it's really like to walk through this territory of your 70s and your 80s and your 90s. And it's not just a fun place. It's not just an upbeat, cool place to be with a nice meal. It's a lifesaver for people. They say, <laughs> so that basically that's, that's my message, is that this is really important to 40% of the people here. And it can be, as Nancy said so beautifully, it can be vibrant again. We can't let it keep sinking. We've got to rebuild it and keep it vibrant because it's a lifeline for people here. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you for that. That was beautiful. You know, um, my mom just passed away a year and a half ago at 91, and I watched her live alone for many years, and I kept saying to her, she lived in Maine, I kept saying to her, why don't you go to the senior center? And because, and she, well, you know, I just don't want to. I can, and she was all that you described, lonely, miserable, and ended up, you know, passing away. I, so it isn't a spouse, but I, I hear you, and I appreciate that. I, I want to be clear, and I know I've said it, and I realize we're in a tough spot here, that we want, I want this to be back to what it was. So I'm going to ask a question, if I may. Given what, and, and I, I would ask you to be thoughtful about this, and I know there are a lot of really thoughtful people here. Okay, sorry. I'm going to ask a question, and I know there's a really th lot of thoughtful people here. I'm going to ask the question, if you were in our shoes right now, with knowing what the information you've seen, what would you be doing? And the answer isn't just go hire someone or just give us our room back. So how would you be approaching this challenge? Because we'll take all the advice we can get. We want to get it right. I find it interesting that one, one thing that you haven't brought up which I've heard many people ask, is why didn't the city go to the Elks Club? And, you know, one of the, an answer to your question is that while you've taken over the senior center, why wasn't the Elks Club 
um, prepared to take the staff there rather than displace people who are already here and are providing a service. Thank you for that question. Um, kind of a complicated answer, but uh, basically the short answer is like most large operations, we have an emergency response plan and we have a system in place for what to do. And our plan was always to come to this building. We practiced it, we had done dry runs of it, the building was set up for it. The Elks Club probably will be the plan in the future. It doesn't have all the internet connections that, and currently has a mold issue. So we can't really occupy it anyway right now. We are mitigating that issue. Um, that's a relatively new city asset. It's a perfectly great question, and I would imagine, well, I say in the future, I don't, we don't know what will be up there in the future. Maybe a whole new facility. For all I know, maybe a new senior center, and you'll all be up there with the pool and the gym and everything else. So who knows what's going to come of that. But in the short term, between now and whenever that happens, that would likely be our location. But for now, this was a pre-planned location. And it's why we're trying to get out of here as quick as we can. We understand. Uh, but we, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we have, th there's really important work happening upstairs and uh, we need, you know, there are people depending on that work as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your lovely PowerPoint presentation. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, uh, one of the first points was that we do not pay the rent. Um, I'd suggest that by virtue of um, the condominium approach, we may not paying rent per se, but we are paying you a fee for, for the use of the building. I guess I'd like to ask you, um, given the financial columns that, that were presented, if there will be an adjustment to our condominium fee for the amount of space the city is now using. It's only, it's only a financial swap from one column to the other, but in what you're trying to demonstrate, I think it's a very important swap. Thank you. I'll answer that question, but I would love to get back to your suggestions of how we move forward, if we can. Um, so, the city owns this building. And the city, not the senior center, the city is the partner in the condominium. So the city is already paying the condominium fee. It goes into a budget, it is in your budget, um, but it's paid for out of the tax portion of the budget. It's part of the overhead. So, um, you know, if you'd like, square footage that we use of the building. It's based on the square footage that the city owns. And so really what you're asking us to do is to make an accounting transfer and have the finance department or, or the planning department pay that portion of the space. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Okay. I hear you. Um, and we'll, we'll consider that. I'm not sure it's, at the end of the day it's going to make a lot of difference. I would like to um, really. <laughs> I would like to build on the point that you were making about this place being a lifesaver. It's more than a lifesaver. It's a spirit saver, and I think as this group comes together, there. Oh, <laughs> as this group comes together, there's an energy in this room right now that. It um, feels like there's a spirit in this room too. And we need to use that part of us to build on practical things that would attract more people. And we must, COVID has only been mentioned once. 
COVID is happening now in the community, and we are uh, concerned about that. And if people can't come here, they certainly, more people could come on Zoom. I think we need to build uh, more um, workshops or whatever that relate to the spirit of this group and the community on Zoom that would help finances, perhaps, um, and you know, use that as um, the spirit for practical matters. Hi, I'm Deb. I'm Deb Robinson, and I just wanted to make sure that we were aware that one of the issues for us as seniors is that many of us live alone. And the COVID was really, really difficult. And not having the space here available and the programs available means that 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 emotional thing is still present with us. We're not able to come together and see other people's faces. You know, I, I keep talking about three dimensional people are really important. <laughs> you know, and you don't get it on Zoom. No, you don't. And and that's I think that's one of the one things that most of us here feel is we need this space in order to maintain our, our, our mental health. Thank you, I agree. George in the back's been trying to get in for a while. In the back. Hi. Uh, George Olson. Uh, Maybe I don't need the mic. Do I need, okay. Um, so my question, Bill, is back to your question. Um, but first of all, I wanna honor what everybody else has said here. It's been a wonderful discussion at this point. Lots of great questions and comments. Um, hiring um, uh, a director is essential, I think. That's the piece that's important to us. Um, hiring a, a director is essential. That's really important. We must have a director here. And when Jana was here and prior to that, um, the place was vibrant. And you can see the decline. One of the things that happened was the advisory council, this is to Diane's uh, point earlier, uh, recommended another director. And unfortunately, the person who was the assistant city manager at the time didn't take the um, advisory council's recommendation, and they hired someone else. And, and so I think that's a f an important factor to consider. And that was prior to Kelly being here. Uh, and I think then things, then things declined a bit, and, uh, and, and of course, uh, the focus was on feast, uh, and that certainly uh, didn't help this place because I was here a number of times with some old friends uh, prior to this time and had a wonderful meal as everybody suggested so I really want to honor all that they said one of the things that I wanted to address a little bit was um, about the decision about the endowment uh, who makes the decision about the endowment and you also mentioned bill that uh, in times of need maybe you could use money for that and we know that um, I'm not sure what the will says what the Jackman fund says who controls it um, what was Jackman's um, requests at that time, I don't know that. And so it, one of the things that could happen in order to hire a director at this point if we need money, maybe there could be a one-time um, uh, use of that fund to hire a director. Um, anyway, so I've thank, finished, thank, thank you. Thank you, George, George, why you still have the mic? George, I got a question yeah, for you, sure. why you still have the yeah. mic? Because I, I, I hear what you're saying and I'm okay. picking up on it. So help me with this. Sure. What, we hire a director or an activity, whatever we call it. What do you think, and I'm, then I'm gonna ask you know, others to weigh in, what are the skills? What, what, is, what is that person capable of doing? What's their skills? What are their strengths? What, what are they bringing that we don't have? Do you have, I mean, you all are here. What do you think? Well, and I, I mean that sincerely, because that's what we're trying yeah. to figure out. Um, I'm sure that a lot of people- And your opinion, that your opinion, is me, just your opinion. You, I'll give it a shot. So yeah. one of the things that was mentioned earlier was about the importance of, con of connecting with council on aging and community organizing and so forth. That's an essential skill. I think the people need, the person that you hire needs to understand the issues of the elderly and of us, of us seniors. I don't like the word elderly. I like seniors better. Uh, and. And uh, I'm a senior. This is my birthday today. I'm 76. <laughs> Happy I always, birthday I always make, to yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, yeah, it's just not about me. <laughs> Although I do try to make it that way. But, uh, I, uh, I 
So I think that's an important piece. I think you need to look at who this person is and what, and what they understand the issues of seniors. And there are people out there who have those qualities. Yeah. And I think it's important that, they, that we look for that person. If Thank you. If you and I'm going to yield the floor. Bye-bye. <laughs> Jerry, all right. Here I am again. Um, so you asked in the senior direct what we're looking for. One thing we're looking for is a person who knows all the senior members that basically presses the flesh. So they come to events, they're out and about, and they know who we are. I think that, that would be incredibly important. The other thing that um, we need to do is straighten out this whole uh, Meals on Wheels thing, which I keep going back to, yep. because the present cook right now does not cook for the senior center. So POA has to go out and hunt around to find people to um, cook the meals. And I also heard there was some grant that was um, written to hire another cook, which sounds kind of crazy to me. Um, so that certainly needs to be um, looked at. And again, a very clear job um, description, because the senior center director also has to be really good working with volunteers if you want this place to come back. We've got to, you, we've got to really use our volunteers really well. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> I have a couple of comments. One is, um, <clears throat> one is, can you hear me? Oh, okay. One is um, the statistics that you showed earlier show that for about 10 years, things were fine financially and so on under the direction of the previous director. And you keep wandering around saying, we need to figure out what the qualifications of a director should be. You know that already. You just look at that and say, okay, do we need to add something or subtract something here? So it's not like this is a mystery when you just go back and say this is what happened. <clears throat> but the main comment I have is that you keep saying we don't want to make things worse and we want the senior center to succeed. At the same time, you are taking away the infrastructure for the center to succeed and you are taking the inf away the infrastructure which makes things worse. You're taking, away, you're taking away classroom space, you're taking away um, leadership and oversight of the programs. Who is right now looking for classroom space? Who is looking for classroom space? Is that Arnie or is that Kelly? Excuse me, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Who is, who is looking at classroom space right now? Uh, Arnie uh, what? or Kelly? What's the word? Looking Who's looking classroom, for classroom space, space. got it. Got it. Who is writing grants? Is Arnie writing grants? Is Kelly writing grants? Who is directing the fundraising? I don't know. Who is directing the fundraising? Who is planning the programs? This is pretty late already in the, in the semester, and we need to plan the programs. Um, who recruits and supervises volunteers now? So thank you for that, those questions. And I appreciate your comment about what we had worked. I want to remind people that um, you know Jana did a fabulous job. This is not anti-Jana, but the f but she was not the prime fundraiser. You remember Dan Groberg worked here, and that was his position. And technically, that's part of Matt's position. So this is what we're trying to figure out: is who, what are the strengths? What are the things? That, do we need a person stronger in fundraising than we've had in the past? And um, so I think you're right. We do know what need, needs to succeed, but we have to look at um, all the pieces. Uh, it, so Jana was great. Dan was great. This place thrived. And what's the right combo to get it back? Hi, I'm Carolyn Ridpath. And we talk about the advisory committee and I'm wondering if this, this isn't the time for them to take a look and see if maybe it needs to be restructured in a way they feel would be more effective. Hello, my name's Carol Montgomery. I've lived in Montpelier for six years. 
If I was 20 years younger, I would apply for this job. I have been an executive director of a foundation. I've written grants. I have a lot of ideas. I'm limited on time for a number of reasons, medical and family. But I know this can be done. I think you need an executive director. I can help you write that job description if you haven't written it yet. Um, I've brought a, a, a fledgling organization to a foundation with 501c3 status. It's not an easy thing to get if you've never done it. It's a lot of work. I think my motto has always been solutions, not obstacles. And I have a lot of respect for everybody in this room, but I'm hearing about the past. You can't change that. We can only move forward, and I believe the advisory committee should perhaps have a little more power. Um, I worked with a board, and on that board, there was a chair of fundraising. There was a chair of membership. There was a chair of, uh, of many, many departments, and they reported they worked with the executive director to make it all happen, and we were very successful. But it takes a lot of people with the, the time and the background to give to that. So that's what I think we should be looking for. I have some other ideas, but I'll, 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 I'm writing them down. So thank you. Acting interim director for. <laughs> yeah, um, the not knowing the person, I have no idea about whether um, they want or should be the acting interim director. But that is <laughs> that is in fact what I would immediately do within the next two weeks. Is I would do what any social service agency does when they have lost their director, um, which is I would. I would ask Jana, I would ask Beth Stern, who used to direct the um, Council on Aging, and anybody else with knowledge in this area, who would they recommend who may have retired or may be available for some other reason to step in as an interim executive director within the next couple of weeks with the assignment? What we need you to do is to plug the holes in the, you know, basically figure out where's the money going and not coming in, plug the holes, write the grants while we are in the process of over the next several months budgeting for and hiring an executive director with the skills that any other ED of an, you know, of, of a community organization that works with elders would have, who can do fundraising, who's good at organizing people, um, who has understanding of the needs of older people. Um, but first and foremost, there's, there's no reason that I can see why um, there hasn't, you know, why there wasn't a plan for hiring an acting ED um, when you knew that the current, that the most recent director was leaving. And I would do that immediately. Just pull somebody out of retirement for, with the understanding, is this going to be for a few months to, to, um, you know, kind of plug the holes and kind of keep things afloat um, while you're working on hiring a permanent person. Thank you. Please do that. Does anybody else have any questions? This one up here, too. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me without a lot of reverberation going on? I'm going to change where I'm standing. I hadn't heard a whole lot about the Elks Club. Can you still hear me okay? Oh, yeah. I hadn't heard a lot about it, and I was quite upset when I, about what I did read about it. And I'll preface my remarks by saying that in a few weeks I'll turn 94. And, and I love to dance at the farmer's market, so all of you come over and dance, okay? I, am, I have this sense that many elderly people have of being shunted aside because you don't know how valuable we are, for one thing. And you don't, a lot of people have forgotten that the baby boomers are arriving at elderly. And that is one mighty <laughs> large there. group of people. We've arrived. <laughs> right? And we have to make sure that we have what we, I'm not a baby boomer. I was born the day after the stock market crashed in 29. But it went up the day I was born on Friday. <laughs> and then it went back down on Monday and Tuesday. And it was all over. I also taught in this building five years when it was St. Michael's High School. And I may have taught some of you folks, 
I taught Liz Jeffords in sixth grade in Burlington. I taught Pat Leahy in this building. And nobody else on the planet can say that. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel I have the right to speak, but I'm also embarrassed that somebody might say, oh, what a show off. Because I was a nun 20 years, and you didn't get up and show off, okay? <laughs> but I brought with me a copy of a few lines I wrote just a few years ago, and pardon my bad, that's not good teaching, I'm sorry. Um, the title is The Old, and if my voice starts reverberating, please let me know, or if you can't hear me properly, all right? The Old. Our backs are now bent. Our eyes could be better. Our legs move with effort. Our arms can't carry much. We once were the new builders of bridges, keepers of forests, makers of roadways. We now are the old, sharers of stories, town criers of truth sages of villages. We are the old. We are here. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we are almost at the end of our time, and it kind of feels like we shouldn't go after that. Um, so I would like to thank all of you for your time and um, your frankness. I was counting on it, I got it, and I really appreciate it. We, uh, we do want to get this right, and I know maybe you have doubt about that, but we do, and hearing from you today is very helpful. I sincerely mean it when I, when I said uh, suggestions that you have about how we approach this, and we heard what you had to say. You know, Kelly's working right upstairs. My email address is available, phone call. Many of you know me, uh, see me down the street or whatever. Um, we we want to hear it, and we, my takeaway is you, you want to know what we're going to do right now. And I think that's a, that we owe you that answer. And, well, it won't be in the next five minutes, but soon. You got 15, okay, thank you. Um, so with that, thank you for coming. Okay, so the suggestion is for a committee in addition to the advisory council. So we'll take a look at that. Anyway, thank you all. Hope you all have a great day. It's supposed to be nice out. Appreciate your time. <laughs>